Hey folks, thanks for your patience. I'm a little sweaty, uh, that's okay. Uh, yeah, these uh, MacBook Air cords are wonderful and you need the specific one and that changes all the time. Okay, uh, so this is a bit of an interactive presentation. Um, I'm not a fan of slide decks if I can instead invite you into an experience. So, um, invite you to in your browser and if you're the type who wants to see source code before visiting a URL, props to you. I just open source the code for this presentation, which happens to also be written in React Native as one example of the many things you can do with React Native. Uh, zoom in. That doesn't really help you with the URL, which is github.com slash arcade city. And you can find it at the top there or do slash rnprez. Cool. Uh, that also has a link at the top to where this is hosted or you can go directly to that, which is rn.arcadelabs.co. Um, <laughs> um, uh, if anyone has trouble accessing this, let me know. Uh, a thing I intended to do but did not get to was uh, take the links uh, and put them into a separate doc, which um, that might be something if anyone has trouble getting into these links, uh, the ones that are in this world, uh, maybe someone could help kind of get that. Uh, we'll figure that out later. So. Um, we're gonna be talking about mobile apps today. I'm gonna to give like a five to 10 minute introduction to what is React Native in the context of mobile application development, why you should care about React Native, why I think React Native is the smartest choice for anyone who's looking to learn uh, mobile application development today. Uh, 30 to 60 second overview of how React Native is currently being used by a number of Bitcoin and Lightning apps you've probably heard of. Um, I'll briefly touch on some of the like no code alternatives if you wanted to build a mobile app and not touch any code. I don't really have any experience with that, but uh, found a good list of resources to share. Um, and then we're very quickly going to get into the link called Snack, which is kind of the equivalent of, I think a few weeks ago for the web dev seminar we were using CodePen. It's basically CodePen, but for React Native Expo apps. And I'll explain what those are in a bit. A uh, brief intro to the world. If you hop into the world at rn.arcadelabs.co, um, this is a, a kind of pointer lock situation. So you want to click once on the browser. It assumes you're on a laptop. Uh, I'm not, not sure if this will work at all on uh, iPad or mobile. But uh, move around with WASD. You got a little um, physics simulation here. <laughs> Just kind of randomly uh, shooting cubes and spheres all over the place. Uh, fun fact, each of these... Uh, uh, 3D assets are also React components, and we'll get into what that means a little bit later. Uh, but like this box here has a little bit of HTML attached to them that says, I am a React component. Click or hover to change my state. Uh, WASD. And so are you in pointer lock? So like click with your, um, okay. Okay. What browser are you using? Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I've only tested this in Chrome. Um, you, okay, cool. So I'm, I'm guessing you might have some like really aggressive like ad block or something. I don't know what there would even be on this. Cool. Uh, so the, if you remember a few weeks ago, for those who were here for the React um, seminar, you know, there's different things where you have like a use state hook. And you can kind of like change the state of things. Um, we're basically changing the state of this React component called a cube. Uh, it changes pink when we hover over it, and if we click on it, it you know goes up and then goes down. Okay, um, this is just a fun little thing. So there's my opening slide. Welcome to React Native for noobs. Uh, we're going to step through these links over here. Each of these uh, is a link. So if you hover your mouse over it and click it, it'll pop open a, a link. We're going to step through these. Um, one little gotcha if you are Coming back to the world from an external link, sometimes if you like click again, it'll open the link a second time. Uh, it's just one of the peculiarities of pointer lock. You just kind of want to move to the side a little bit before reclicking. I whipped this up like all yesterday, so it's <laughs> not exactly polished. Just a little quick demo of what you can quickly build um, with React and React Native. Um, so first of all, let's go through the first tab, and you're welcome to follow along on your own computer, or uh, I'll step through it up here. Uh, React Native, I like to call it the one good thing that ever came out of Facebook. Uh, the scroll down at the bottom of reactnative.dev, which is the official uh, React Native website. Uh, you'll see it's from Meta Open Source. Um, 
They open sourced this years ago. It's since taken on a life of its own. The Facebook open source team is active in some ways, but it's really become its own standalone community. Um, this has kind of got some good basic introductory stuff. We're not going to be interacting with the development APIs or anything here. We're going to be using the Expo framework instead for that. Uh, but just for some basic introduction, the, the whole idea behind React Native is that you learn one set of code bases, one, one framework, um, borrowing heavily from, uh, if you're familiar at all with web development, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, very similar uh, versions of those. React Native might have a version called like JSX, um, but it's, it's all, the, if, you, if you know JavaScript and some of these web technologies, you already know the majority of what you need to um, build a mobile app. So the idea is you're building native apps for Android and iOS using React. Um, they don't really mention it here, but you can support um, all sorts of other different platforms, including Apple Watch, um, you know, websites, as you've seen, the, it's a React Native uh, app running in the browser called React Native Web. Um, you know, iOS TV, I'm not sure their current Windows support, but I know there's been a big React Native Windows push I haven't paid that much attention to. But yeah, the idea is you write it in JavaScript, you render it in nat native code. This is good for some things, but not other things. Uh, and where you would want to use certain of the device hardware, that's where certain libraries you pull in that would let you have access to those things. The best introduction to the sort of native tool set that you have uh, actually will come from the second link here. So if you come back into the world, let me kind of move. We engage pointer lock, or you can just copy the URL from, it's just expo.dev. And I'm logged into my Expo account, so I'm gonna open this in an incognito web browser and just show you the landing page. Uh, so Expo is basically a, a framework that sits on top of React Native that makes it as easy as possible for you to get a new app started. Um, if you are, have paid any attention to React Native development in the community over the last few years, some of the Criticisms about React Native is because it's still relatively early compared to certain of the you know, pure native frameworks. Um, there have been maybe some bugs or a lot of gotchas you know, combined with the complexities of a fast-moving JavaScript ecosystem where there's all sorts of node packages that are changing all the time. Uh, it can be hard to um, keep track of all of what's going on. Uh, the Expo framework came in to help kind of solve a lot of that, and it's now sort of the main recommended way if you're getting your feet wet with React Native for the first time. Don't try and go figure things out from the Facebook's React Native official website. The recommendation is that you start with Expo. And I think even on the React Native official website, uh, starting an Expo app is now like the officially recommended way to start for new people. Um, so to my point about the, the kind of native libraries, if at, on the Expo website, if you click on Docs, um, we're going to look for where it says API because we want to just give you a sense of all of the... Um, here, API reference. So on the left side here, and if anyone sees anything that like is looks cool or that you want to briefly read the doc of up here, let me know. I'll just read out a few of these. Um, these are all of the wrappers that Expo offers you, packages basically, that you can pull into your project to have very easy access to your device. For example, accelerometer. So if you wanted to build an app that used your device accelerometer, maybe you wanted to build a workout app, maybe it paid you lightning satoshis for how many steps that you took, you would use this package, Expo Accelerometer. You know, the specific package is Expo Install, Expo Sensors. Um, this stuff you're not going to need to know for today. Uh, there's, they've got really clear um, documentation in here for what commands to put into your command line. If you're not sure how to use your command line, they've also got great introductory materials for how you set up your de development environment with Yarn, NPM, and all that great stuff. Um, we're not going to get into that today. Uh, we're going to be using the in-browser uh, tool set called Snack, which is going to let us build mobile apps in the browser as well as test them on our device. Uh, so don't worry so much about this, but you know, basically everything that you would need to know about interacting with the accelerometer package uh, is here. And they give you code examples that you can copy and paste and adapt. Uh, as well as the APIs, so telling you all of the different little methods that you know go into the accelerometer. App loading, app authentication, application asset. I'm not going to read all of these, but like AV for controlling recording, audio, barcode scanner, battery life, blur view, brightness, calendar, camera, checkbox, clipboard, <clears throat> crypto. That's just for um, certain cryptographic functions. Uh, 
So for example, like the, the crypto um, package for Expo is an easy way of generating entropy on your device. So one thing later, if anyone wants to ask about how I was able to get certain of the like web-centric Nostra libraries working in the mobile device, one of the things that is good that uh, native devices provide natively is entropy generation or like secure randomness. Um, this Expo library lets you do that easily for Android and iOS and <clears throat> haven't used the web version, but uh, so device, anything here, jump out at anyone that they're like, ooh, that sounds cool, or I want to know more about that. It's kind of, there's like a, probably a hundred different things here. So beneath that, we have components. These are standard React Native components. Um, in a couple minutes, when we're going to be in the snack together, we're going to be composing a Lightning wallet, a very basic Lightning wallet, using these components. Uh, I'll do a super quick intro to them, uh, mainly the ones that we'll need. We're not going to really need activity indicator. We might want to demonstrate in like a loading state. It's just like a cool little load spinner that you can style. Um, buttons, we're going to be using that definitely. You know button, what happens when you press the button, what's the name of the button, what's the color of the button, and an accessibility label. On the uh, API reference, if you scroll down underneath Expo SDK, and you can collapse the Expo SDK uh, to get there faster. It's under React Native components. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so button, image. Uh, flat list, we'll probably use that for maybe if we display a, a list of transactions. It's like a performant way of rendering a lot of data uh, structured similarly. Um, what else might we use? Input, scroll view, text, text input. And then view is kind of like the equivalent in um, web dev to a, a div. OK, any questions about this before we start diving into Snack and getting our hands dirty? Questions? So um, to clarify, Expo, it is React Native. It's just like one kind of abstraction above it. Um, Expo, for example, it's just mainly optimized at the smoothest possible developer experience. So if you want a map, you just go here, you type Expo install map view, and they pull you in what I would call sensible defaults. So the Expo map view, for example, if you're on um, iOS, by default, it defaults to Apple Maps. On, if you're on Android, it defaults to Google Maps. You can like hard code that if you want to. And then it gives you one kind of unified surface API of, I want to create a beacon. And just being able to know, this is going to work the exact same on iOS or Android. If you want to do a more advanced map, um, like the map that I've used with Arcade City is Mapbox. There have been a lot of people requesting that Expo add support for Mapbox, but they haven't. Um, and so there's just a whole additional level of like, well, now I've got to go pay attention to the state of the official Mapbox React Native map support, which has been horrible. It's only community supported. So there's a, a period of time where like the, the official Mapbox team dropped complete support for the React Native app. It eventually got picked up by the community. So there's a period of time where it, got, it like fell way behind the rest of the things. So it's like, if, you don't, if, if you're the type of person who wants to kind of min-max or you really need to squeeze performance out, like you can go deep, but Expo lets you like as a solo developer or a small team have the confidence of like, okay, we know that this Expo API is not going to be randomly shifting. It's like it's solid. You had a question, Super? Yeah. Fair, I, I would draw the parallel to you as a vanilla JS maxi. You know, that would be React Native, whereas someone using React would be more Expo. You can do both. You can do both, both or either. Um, and there, there's definitely benefits to going the, the, the uh, more bare level React Native approach. But I would say more and more use cases, more and more professional teams are using Expo for, for more things. Um, potentially a longer conversation. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, let's go to our, so there's two things that we'll need to do for setup. Um, you don't have to do them, but I recommend you do them. So um, we're gonna be going into Expo Snack. Uh, and if you wanna just kind of open that up, this is the one tab that we're all definitely gonna be active in. When you open this up, um, it'll like give you a randomly named project and you can start changing the code in here however you'd like right now and kind of getting familiar with how it works. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the two other things, if you want to kind of build along and, and get to the point where you're able to like get potentially a testable Lightning wallet on your own device, uh, the two things that you're going to want to sign up for are Expo Go uh, and then create a, a free account at LNPay, which we're going to use for the Lightning wallets. Um, Expo Go is the official native application for both Android and iOS um, for testing Expo apps uh, kind of in a development environment yourself. Let's see that I got that link correct. Hang on a second. Yeah. And the, the link for this is expo.dev slash client. So um, when we're in Snack, uh, you'll be able to see a really basic version of the app that you build in the sidebar. Um, you'll be able to see what it looks like on iOS and on Android and on web. And it'll also give you a QR code. If you scan that QR code on your phone when you have one of these apps uh, installed, then it'll open your app on your actual device uh, in, in that Expo Go app. You don't have to do that, uh, but if you want to like feel it in your hand, uh, that's a quick download. You might want to get that going. And then um, you don't have to do it now, but we're going to be, uh, after we do a little bit of an intro in Snack of uh, some React Native code, we're going to connect this to LNPay. Um, LNPay is um, a great service. I use it primarily for hackathons. Uh, it's just a way for you to create an account and be able to create Lightning wallets. Uh, I'm not even sure exactly what their like architecture is that they're running this on. I know that you can kind of connect your own node if you want to. Um, and uh, Tim? Cool. Yeah, Tim's the guy behind this. I met him at like a hackathon here a, a year ago. Great guy. It, it just someone else can maybe vouch for how it's used by other projects. I use it for hackathons. It's just the simplest way to kind of be able to interact with Lightning wallets and make payments and invoices and stuff uh, via an a API, which we're going to be doing uh, shortly. Um, so one comment on um, like the work of a developer, and, and, and I intentionally did not kind of have a, a fully like done example for you. There's plenty of apps like, for example, Blue Wallet um, is a you know great Bitcoin Lightning wallet that is all written in React Native. You can go on Blue Wallet's GitHub and look through the code of an established wallet um, and learn about how an actual wallet works. Um, but a lot of the work of a, a mobile application developer, maybe any application developer, um, it, it's really just going through a process of like, I don't know what to do next. Um, what should I do? What APIs are available to me? Um, and so I, I think it's gonna be valuable as we kind of, you know, I did minimal prep work, just making sure I wanted to use LNP and Snack and stuff would, would work for our purposes. But we're, we're really going to, over the next hour, like build a Lightning wallet together um, and, and go and learn, learn up on different APIs and things. Um, so when I say API, um, API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's basically a way for code that you write to hook into some third-party service, uh, or maybe it's how you talk to the back end for your app if you have one. Um, we are not going to write a back end for our app. Um, we are going to have um, the sort of front end or client code, which is going to be our mobile app. It's going to talk only to LNPay, and how it talks to it is through an API. Um, the LNPay docs show what the API is, so let's just go and Take a quick look through there. So if you're, if you're ever brainstorming kind of new app ideas, one way to see what's possible is to just go and see what are third-party services in your ecosystem. What do they offer in terms of an API? These are things that you can hook into. Some companies don't let you fully use their API, but LNPay is specifically intended for application developers to have what are called outsourced custodial wallets. 
and they got some diagrams here about kind of how it works. But um, if I'm evaluating like, you know, kind of some of the, the considerations I had going through preparation for this is like, well, does this meet my needs in terms of letting everyone be able to sign up right away, not need approval and to be able to start meaningfully interacting with lightning? Um, and yeah, there's, uh, you know, they give certain examples here of different libraries that you can use. Um, we are going to be just doing straight um, curl requests. The um, JavaScript library doesn't really work with, with Snack so well. Uh, maybe more on that later. But here's the, you can kind of like look again down at the docs and see kind of what's possible. So in the wallet section, we can create a wallet, retrieve a wallet, list wallets, list wallet transactions, list all transactions for wallet send receive, generate and pay invoice, transfer between wallets, wallet streaming payments. That's a little more advanced. Not going to do that today, but key send, uh, and then different things for getting invoice status as well as LNURL withdraw, LNURL pay. So if you wanted to have in your app the ability to just create a QR code that someone could scan and get money right away, it's just simple API calls to the LN pay uh, um, API. And they, you know, when you create an account, they'll give you an API key. Later in this talk, we're going to be connecting your API key, or I'll connect my API key to our snack so that we're able to make actual Lightning transactions um, in the browser, probably. And, and you know, the, the success will be if we can get that also working on our mobile app. Um, and there may be problems we discover along the way, but there's, there's always problems. So uh, half, half, what percentage of your time, developers, would you say you spend like fixing bugs or <laughs> going from one bug to the next? It's a lot. Cool. Okay, uh, any questions before we dive into code? It's, it's very similar. Um, in fact, we could probably have used Ellen Bits. Um, I, I can't even really articulate what I can think. I know, I know Ellen Bits, I tend to associate it with like, it's something that you want to run on infrastructure or a node that you control. But I know also that there was like, you know, ellenbits.com or whatever. And anyone who knows better than me the answer to this, feel free to chime in. But uh, very similar idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just one of the, I, you know, definitely a downside to Ellen Pay is, to my knowledge, it's not open source. Uh, but for purposes of just like banging together a demo, um, it's great. Okay. So go into um, Snack. The URL is snack.expo.dev. Uh, if you want to save your work, you can create a free account. Um, I think it'll, I don't know if you, it'll say if you need to create an account in order to like have a persistent URL, if you want to save your work. Cool, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna sk step through this example code. Uh, just to explain what everything does briefly. And then we're going to start hacking it up. And uh, we're going to start, gonna start creating uh, what we'll call the, the worst lightning wallet ever um, uh, in the browser here. And then so just a, a little bit of a tour here. So on the left, here's your project um, folder. You can see the app.js uh, is what we have open. There's your project folder. You've got a, a folder of assets. Right now, that just has the image that displays, snack-icon.png. You've got a folder for components, which has this component. It's basically a, a, a batch of code that you reference from a, you know, another file, like this app file has asset example here. Um, you know, view and text here are React Native components uh, that we get from the React Native library, but this asset example is uh, you know, a separate component that we pulled into a separate, or they pulled into a separate file. Uh, App.js is the main file. Uh, Package.json, um, this is the first file that if you're ever trying to like figure out what a new project on GitHub, let's say you go to Blue Wallet's um, GitHub page, you want to see kind of what libraries they're using, uh, you want to go to their package.json because this will tell you all of the package dependencies that they're pulling in. So for example, this um, uh, project has three dependencies on React Native Paper, Expo Vector Icons, Expo Constants. This is a little bit deceptive because they're hiding the um, kind of underlying React 
uh, React Native dependencies. Um, but if you were to start like a fresh Expo project, you would see that it kind of starts you off with five five different packages. And so th this is a concept that any you know web developer or uh, Node.js developer is familiar with. With React Native, you have full access to the entire um, ecosystem of NPM packages, NPM standing for Node Package Manager. Um, and so there's some packages that may not work as well with native or you got to kind of write shims for it. Um, can go into that a little bit more later. And then the readme just will have some basic info. Let's read the readme. Sample snack app. Open the app.js file to start writing some code. You can preview the changes directly on your phone or tablet by scanning the QR code or use the iOS or Android emulators. When you're done, click save and share the link. When you're ready to see everything that Expo provides, or if you want to use your own editor, you can download your project and use it with Expo CLI. That's the Expo command line interface, which if you click that link, it can tell you how to install that. Uh, and if, again, if uh, towards the end of this, if anyone wants help kind of getting a, an Expo environment set up locally, I'm happy to troubleshoot any of that. Uh, all projects created in Snack are publicly available, so you can easily share the link to this project via link or embed it on a web page with the brackets button. If you're having problems, blah, 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 Snack is open source, you can find the code on the GitHub. All right, so let's take a look at this and uh, make sure we understand what's going on and then start hacking it up. Uh, so at the top of a React file, and, and this will all seem familiar uh, if you were at the React web um, uh, class. So we're first importing React, that's standard. Uh, sometimes in Expo environments, you actually don't even need to do that. It'll like kind of handle it automatically, um, but that's fine. Um, from the main React Native, I think it's grayed out because it's basically show, showing that it's not necessary. In fact, let's kind of delete it and see what happens. Yeah, it's, it's still working. So it, yeah, gray out usually means this is code that you're not using or is not, not needed. So I don't, I don't know why it was there. Um, so from the React Native package, we're pulling in text view and style sheet. Style sheet is kind of the React Native version of CSS. You can see that the style sheet definition at the bottom has things that are essentially CSS classes um, with it in a different casing. And there's other ways of, um, there's various kind of CSS in JS um, plugins. If you want a API for styling that's more similar to what's on the web, there's all sorts of different uh, packages that you can explore. But when you're getting started, the, the basic style sheet from React Native is, is just fine. Don't need to uh, complicate it. But this is just this is just kind of setting us up with the basics. Yeah. 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 This is definitely not um, you know structured for large project. Uh, what I've seen often is if there's like a, a a module like like a ride module, they might have you know ride module folder and then like screens components and then within components there'll be like the components themselves and then living next to the file will be you know ride request.style.ts and it'll import from that and then there's some of the various like css and js things have different ways of kind of aggregating styles via templates and and symbols and all that stuff um so yeah this is definitely like you know large application structuring, you're not, you're not learning that at this point, but you know, happy to talk about that later. Um, so here, uh, anything again, also with React, uh, double slash, is a comment you can import from local files. So this is importing the asset example from our asset example component, which is also just like, you know, the view, the text, the actual text, image, and the separate styling. <clears throat> Go back here. And then card. So React Native Paper is a, I guess they would describe it as like a, a UI library. Yeah, a high quality standard compliant material design library. Just for if there's different like UI kit things, you'll you can pull pull these in to make it look a little more pretty than the um, kind of base React Native components. So so let's start hacking this up. 
what should the background color of our terrible lighting app be? Black was the first thing I heard. Yeah. Where did our text go? Okay. Let's also set the text for now to be white. And uh, as you type, you'll get these type hints. So you can see kind of what's possible to go in that text style. And you can see, maybe you can see, oops. Where it says text style here, this is actually the type. Um, and then uh, again, a separate conversation is, um, uh, I use TypeScript. Um, some people don't like TypeScript. There's different kind of typing libraries. But even if you're not using TypeScript, you still have some access to the type that they use TypeScript, I think, under the hood to kind of help you with this, this code completion. And uh, if you kind of hover over each one, it'll, uh, it should give you a little bit of hints about like what the props or the description of that. Um, some of that you'll just get way better in your browser. Uh, this is kind of like a basic version of everything. Uh, let's try setting our paragraph text to white. Okay, so we can see everything. Um, this component, we don't really need that right now. Let me try commenting out asset example. Okay. The uh, standard way of shortcutting comments didn't work. Um, one interesting gotcha is that if you're inside of a return statement like this, this is called JSX. And then this here would be Java. So if I wanted to like write something and then comment that out. And by the way, I'm hitting Apple slash is the commenting shortcut. Um, but you can also just put two slashes there. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to comment something out uh, inside of JSX, uh, there's a different syntax, which usually your text editor will have. Uh, let's see if I even remember. Yeah. Anyway, so I just wanted to kind of remove that real quick and just see what that would look like. Okay, so now it's just basically an empty card. Um, we can bring card back later. For now, I'm just going to delete that. And uh, let's call this... Where's Lightning Wallet? And then under that, let's put another text, kind of a subheadline. And now, right now, that's just using this paragraph style. This is going to be kind of sloppy. So basically, you want to just code, do the well, one principle that I like is just do whatever's necessary to get you the thing that you want until your code starts like smelling and then go back and refactor it. Um, Let's, so we're going to do something smelly, which is we're going to be like copy pasting some of the things that are relevant from there. Uh, but we're going to make a couple changes. We're going to say we want the font size to be 12. We don't want it to be bold. Let's see if that auto formats it for us. Oops. And then there's yellow squiggles. Let's see what the yellow squiggles mean. Unusual style detected. Styles dot subheadline. Well, that's because we haven't used it. That's called a ESLint type hint. That's nice. So we're going to put that up here. So instead of styles.paragraph, styles.subheadline. And we don't want this huge margin. I want to change the margin on paragraph to be margin horizontal. So it's not also margin vertical. And then I'm going to change worse lighting wallet to say, seriously, do not use it. OK. So let's think about it. When someone opens up our worst lightning wallet, what do we want them to see? OK. Let's do this. First, I'll do balance, 0. I'm just hard coding 0. And this is probably worth giving it its own text style. And feel free to diverge from this and do whatever you want uh, aside from this. Uh, you're also welcome to submit a PR to the presentation if you want to edit the 3D world at all uh, and kind of study that. Um, all right, so styles.balance, let's go down here. Sometimes it'll auto tab this for you. All right, let's do balance. Let's make this orange. You can use um, hex or RGB or uh, just basic words in here. Let's align that. Okay. 
For now, I'm going to delete these things, get rid of the stuff that we're not using. Constants. It's using constants for padding top. Do I care about that? Sometimes it's nice to just go through and remove everything that you're not like, you don't feel really compelled to save. Okay, I'm gonna do something now that's optional, um, but to kind of get to Austin's question about kind of extracting some of this, um, one thing we often do is kind of extract things to be you know, one thing per file. So for example, right now we've got app, um, and let's say, just say for now I wanna add a, um, a separate file we'll call, can I rename? Yeah, what's going on here? Well, that's not good. It's not letting me scroll down there. What does that do? Duplicate, okay. We'll call this um, styles.js. Let me delete this extra thing if I can. Okay. All right, so I'm actually gonna take this blob of code down here I'm going to copy, or I'm going to cut it, and I'm going to come over to styles.js, and I'm going to paste it. And then there's two changes that we need to make. Anyone want to know what we need to do here? Uh, yep, but what about in this file? What are the two things we have to do? Yep. So right now, if you're just declaring a const, that's only gonna be accessible in the file that it's in, but we need to export it so we can uh, import it from other files. And then what else do we have to do? Yep. And let's see if they've got a helper for us. No. Okay. If you're in, uh, like if I'm in VS Code, if I hover right there and I do Command I, it'll pull up like a list of things that it can think that you wanna import that from. That's okay, we'll practice typing it. Import style sheet from React Native. And so that should work fine. Now the red arrow we've got here is styles is not defined because we removed it from asset example. Oops, not asset, we removed it from app. So now we're no longer using style sheet in this file and we are going to import styles, is that what we call it? From components slash styles.js. Okay, that feels a little nicer. Uh, when we get a little further, we're probably gonna do that same extraction process for uh, the balance component. Uh, but for now, let's just Try staying in this component. Okay, what's the first thing you should you think we should do? What's the first API call you think that we might make to a Lightning service like LNP? We could try that. So for code that we want to run, let's say we want to run once, or maybe we want to do it, maybe we'll attach it to a button. So let's write a function. Let's write a function called generate invoice. And you'll note that I am kind of above the return statement, still in the app component. And you can write standard JavaScript here. So we're going to write a kind of ES6 component. Um, and we're going to make it an async function. And for now, um, I, I don't remember if we have access to a console log, which I make heavy use of. So let's try this and see if we have access to that. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is um, in order to test our function there, we could put it in a use effect to make it run automatically, but I actually wanna tie this to a button. So let's set up a button. I think it's gonna be button. And now button is the thing where like, almost every time that I need to use a button, unless I'm doing like the most basic stuff, I'll be like, oh, how, what do I need to do with this again? And so for button, I'll go, now button being a React Native component, sometimes then I'll go to the, um, 
official React Native docs. Let's see what they say for button. Maybe they can give us an example. Let's try copy pasting this. They got a little copy icon here. And uh, it's small enough, you'll be able to type it if you don't want to go also hunt this down. But it's, it's at the React Native website. I just searched for button. And we're on their button page. You can read all about button and different types of buttons and things you can do. You cannot do very much styling uh, with buttons. I don't think you can even set the background color. Um, uh, that's why people tend to use the UI libraries or build their own buttons out of touchable opacities. Um, but that's more complicated than we need right now. So, huh? What's it say? Cool. So, oh, there was a line that I removed that you did not remove. Uh, there's like a padding top where it invokes constants. I just deleted that. It just adds a teeny amount of padding um, to take into account the like spacing of the um, app header, which given that everything's centered, I didn't think that's really necessary. So I deleted that. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can copy the import from app.js, which I deleted, but you probably did not, where it said like import star as constants from Expo constants, if you wanted to keep that. I, I just got rid of it. Okay. Cool. Um, you probably did not put the import in braces. Can you check at the top that it looks like mine? Yep, so that, that's just a thing that people will grapple with. Some uh, packages will have what are called default exports, and that's where you'd kind of have no braces. Um, a, a bunch of packages have, well, you, I, don't, I don't know the, even the exact ES6 terminology for that, but yeah, braces uh, should fix that. Uh, good now? Okay. So let's see. So this is saying our error now is on press learn more is not defined. Okay, let's gonna, we're gonna take uh, we're going to replace on press learn more with the name of the function that we actually created. So the button code I got from the React Native website. Um, Expo, I think, has a but page for button two, um, but the button, the like base level React components come from the React, the official React Native library. So I usually, um, if I'm searching for docs about that, I'll go to the official slash docs slash button. And then I just copy pasted that. Yeah. And let's see if I can add some style to this, I think. There's some limitations with what we can style and can't. Yeah, for some reason, um, a lot of components can take a, a style object, like to set margins, and the base layer button does not let us do that. To get around that, we could wrap the button in a view and put the margin on the view. In this case, for now, I'm just going to go add a margin bottom to our text, see where it says balance. I just don't want the, the button to be right underneath the balance. So I'm going to go back to our styles to balance. I'm going to put margin bottom 30. And you all can feel to make whatever you think looks good. Uh, nope. Instead of that, going to take the function that you actually created up top, which we call generate invoice, and just paste that there. So it's button on press equals generate invoice. OK. Let's see if we can. All right, so we'll change the title of our button to generate invoice. And now let's see if what happens if we press this. Now, I don't know if this has access to our console. Let's see. Uh, if you're on Chrome, um, 
Well, if you're on Mac, Option Command J opens up the developer console. Otherwise, you can go to uh, Chrome View Developer JavaScript console. Um, I don't think we have access to the console here. Let me try this again. Yeah. OK, so what you can do instead of that, it's a little bit more annoying if you can just throw an alert. Oh, I didn't press the button, so I wouldn't have known if that would have worked. OK, so right now, if I press the button, generate invoice, I get an alert that says test. So at the, at the moment, we're just making sure that we have a button. When we press the button, we're going to call a function. Then we're going to put the right logic into the function. Uh, anyone want me to help them get cut up to where we are? No. Uh, nope, there should be no secret key or access key. Uh, what is the URL that you're at? Oh, yeah, we're not doing the LMP stuff yet. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know what page you're on. We, we, yeah, we haven't gotten to the LMP stuff yet. We looked at the LMP docs. And we said, here are the things that are possible. What should we build toward? And we said, we're going to build toward generating an invoice. We haven't pulled any of that code in yet. It says test. Yeah. You write it. You'll be able to catch up now because we're just going to slowly build this function out. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is um, experiment with the fetch API, I think. You use that even in the web uh, tutorial, but to make an HTTP call to an API. So let's pull up a, um, for this, just to make sure that like, like we want to test to make sure that fetch works in the context of snack. I might go Google something like um, demo fetch endpoint JavaScript code. Top link is JavaScript fetch API explained by examples. Let's see if there's something in here that I can grab. So the idea here is we are using fetch to get data from a URL, which will pass any options that we need, like authentication tokens. Uh, once we get information back, we handle the response. And if there's any errors, handle the error. And let's see if you can give us an example for an API. Looks like this is just kind of basic stuff that doesn't have, let's see. If I don't quickly find what I'm looking for, I might just like do something simple to get around this, which is basically I want to test to make sure that fetch works. So let's do, let's just fetch. It doesn't have to be prettily formatted. Let's see what happens if we fetch google.com. And we're going to want to assign this to a variable. We'll do const response equals. And then fetch is asynchronous. So we're going to await for it. And usually, I would console log the response just to see what happens. In this case, I'm going to alert it. First, let me see if this actually works. Um, It doesn't. It gives you a um, an XHR error. OK, well, that's good. We do actually have console errors now. OK, great. 
so this is just like a pain in the butt thing and i i've, I've got the way around it because I, I was playing with this yesterday but um sometimes some urls that you fetch they'll freak out that you're like making a call to them from they don't know who you are um and you'll get something like this error here access to fetch google from this origin has been blocked by core's policy no access control allow origin blah 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 of course well of course of course yeah pun got it good it took me a second but um good one jason <laughs> jason placeholder api i want to say here we go this is what i was using yesterday okay json placeholder i want to basically I, I now want to get a url that does actually work here we go this is exactly what i was looking for so um to get here if you because i'll i'll suggest that you pull this code in because we're going to copy the correct url into this code uh json placeholder dot type it code dot com or if you google json placeholder api it's the first thing that comes up okay so there here's a batch of code that i'm going to throw over to here cool Let's see what this does. I'll clean this up in a second. Oops. And I need to put this in here. Uh, so one thing to note is that um, there's two different ways of writing the same kind of asynchronous code. Uh, one is kind of chaining promises. So fetch, it, basically it's like this returns what's called a promise, which is basically like, hang on a second, I need to go get something. Stop going through your code until I give you the answer. Um, then it processes this one and then this one. Um, and the async await is like, the other way of doing that. Um, okay, so here we go. So the error that I got was fetch res.json is just is not a function. So sometimes you just kind of need to like monkey with this a little bit. Let me just uh, do this, clean this up. Oh, it's saying fetch res.json is not a function because it was already called that by that point. Okay, we're alerting the promise. Now I need to. Cool. Let me try this. Oh, because I'm alerting fetch res, not the JSON. try this okay that should do it I parse <laughs> There we go. Okay, so we have, I'll, I'll step you through what I actually did there. Uh, so here we have an example of, we are calling a demo dummy API. We're taking the data that it gives us. We're throwing away the like data that we don't want, converting the rest to JSON, which is, I think it, what, JavaScript standard object notation, something like that. It's just a way of representing data uh, in a really like easy to transport around uh, format. Okay, so what this is doing, um, we're calling fetch the URL. We're getting an initial response. We're converting it to JSON, and we're just this console log doesn't even work at all. Uh, but we're alerting it. If you just alert 
the JSON object, uh, it'll say object object because it it doesn't it has to be stringified in order to show um, it in the alert message. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to take what we're going to be doing is we're going to be calling an API to LNPay. And it's going to be giving us a really long code of LN, BC, blah, 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 that we're going to want to show that data in the wallet in the form of a string and a QR code both. Um, and so whenever we are manipulating the same kind of data, um, we want to put it into one variable that then gets displayed different ways. So before we, you know, in a second, we're going to go uh, get into LN Pay, and I'm going to create a new account so you can see uh, and step through that with me if you want, uh, or you're welcome to set that up now. Uh, but the first thing we're going to do um, is get data that we get back from an API showing to the user. So I, this alert thing is super annoying. So we're actually going to make a, a text box that will show the response in the text box, and then later we'll switch that text box into showing. The actual piece of data that we want, the LNBC, da da da, da that someone can copy paste, uh, or the QR code, or or both. Uh, so this is also something that you might have picked up um, a few weeks ago. We are going to define a simple React state object. Uh, so let's call this. Now we'll call it invoice, even though this is not right now the invoice. Yeah. And we'll need to pull in use state. Yeah, so it's const square brackets invoice comma set invoice closed square bracket equals use state parentheses. And we can even, um, I don't think we have to, but to start, I'm just going to put an empty uh, curly braces in there. So we'll at least have something to render in our little text box to know that it's working. Yep, that's what we're doing now. So import use state from React. Uh, that's not React Native. That's just like common to React. OK, so maybe underneath balance, we'll put a little, uh, I'm going to copy the, I'm going to copy where it says balance. And let's just make that say invoice. And I'm going to replace zero with we're eventually want, going to want this to be just invoice. But for now, because we're using, we're just going to be kind of like wanting to dump out the entire object that we get back from the API, just so we can take a look at it without needing to alert. Uh, we're going to stringify this. So inside the curly braces, I'm going to write JSON dot stringify invoice. Cool. So, and I'll wait for you to catch up to this, but you should see after this invoice, and then our little curly braces. That's what we defined as the initial state. Car. Yeah, it will. Well, yeah, yeah, and we, you know, we started with that because that was the initial idea of like a thing we want to show. Uh, but for like an initial API, we wanted to test. Someone else said generating an invoice, so we'll come back to balance. We'll do that second. But let's just want to test out generating an invoice, and uh, it would be cool if we can kind of. Yeah, there's plenty of people who might not want you to think that it's easy, so that you can pay them a lot of money to hire them as <laughs> mobile application developers. Don't tell them I told you. <laughs> this is stuff that you can learn yourself. Um, I have my background is is in web development, um, and I'll just do a, a quick aside. Um, I, I kind of started teaching myself React Native a little bit, and it was largely working with one of the top React Native design development shops in the world uh, called Infinite Red. Um, I used a bunch of their open source uh, React Native tooling. For the one of the earliest versions of the Arcade City mobile app, uh, we ended up raising some money and we hired them, and they got a case study on their on their website, uh, just kind of going through this app that they designed and built most of for us. And so, getting to, you know, 
work with the code base of an agency that charges thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars and study the patterns that they use over a period of a couple of years. That's what like made me into a really good de React Native developer. I would think myself decently good. Um, but the cool part is that the majority of the stuff that I learned from them is actually open source. And they um, release a, a boilerplate called Ignite. Um, if you Google infinite red ignite, they just like a few days ago released a new version of this. Um, so when you get to the point when you do, um, when you're using the command line instead of snack, um, generally you would start by doing um, an expo, like expo gives you a tool for expo create new app. Uh, that's how I create my apps uh, these days usually. Uh, but if you wanna have like quote unquote application boilerplate, that like gets you navigation, screens, proper application structures. It's, it's the same structure that they use with their paid clients, but they give you a basic version of that um, for free. Yeah, culmination of over six years of constant React Native development. Ignite is the most popular React Native app boilerplate for both Expo and Bear React Native. This is the React Native boilerplate that the Infinite Red team uses on a day-to-day -day basis to build client apps. Developers who use Ignite report that it saves them two to four weeks of time on average off the beginning of their React Native project. Yeah. It's kind of like having like a website, like a little Yeah, like similar to that. Um, Ghost is maybe one step more. They want to give you kind of interfaces, and and this is sort of like the full kind of you know you're 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 coding, it, you're building an app but you're starting off with like really strong um, um, initial patterns. Uh, while I'm thinking of it, just because I, I mentioned the kind of, um, I don't know if I have to even save the link, top no code. And just so people know that there's other options out there, um, there are like tons of services, like the whole, let's see. Yeah, there, there's, there's a whole movement called no code. So if you're not a developer, if you don't want to build, there's still a ton of things that you can do to build apps. Um, but I, I don't think any of this is going to work. Maybe it can work. Like if you're trying to build like specifically a, a Bitcoin or Lightning app, you got you kind of got to get into the weeds, I think. Uh, but there, there's a bunch of options. That's a, a decent site. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that um, it, it really depends on the project. If you are trying, to, if you are a small team who's trying to get a product out sooner than later, and if your team, for example, happen to be primarily web developers, React.js, like that's going to be the fastest way for you to get feedback users probably is a web app. Um, I'm making the shift in some of my current business operations shifting from mobile to web, web first. But I feel really empowered to do that in part because I know that in this React and React Native ecosystem, there's so much code reusability between the two, I can very easily shift the, the focus of the platform uh, as much as possible. If you have a really solid web application, let's say that you're you know, optimizing initially for kind of the best practices of hosting a web application, which might be to build it in Next.js, but with React, hosting it on Vercel, that's what a lot of like startups do these days. You can still take a lot of that code and, and pull it into a React Native environment before too long. It, it could be worth, if you know that mobile is important, it could be worth creating, you know, the, the, the web tooling, for example, of React Native has evolved to the point, it's gotten quite good. Uh, the, the presentation URL is a expo app using the web tooling, uh, but it also does not yet have as good of support for some of the like URLs and SEO that, for example, Next.js has. So there, there's trade-offs with both of it. I would say web can be just fine for getting started. I wouldn't necessarily say start with mobile if, if, you, if you have folks that are more experienced with web. It's definitely cheaper to get web developers than mobile. But I think that the cost of mobile is going to come down as, as these technologies get more adoption. Hope I answered your question. Okay, let's keep going with this. So we've got a little, um, you know, we've connected a piece of state like a like a empty JSON object to this. Now let's set that and make sure that our API call data. So instead of alerting it, let's set 
in the uh, callback of the API call, let's do set invoice JSON. And if all goes well, if I hit the button, boom. Okay, so we've got our demo API call now connected to our interface. And uh, before we jump into the LN bits piece, this might be worth testing to see if we can get it working on um, mo uh, mobile. So, so I'm, I'm in the web view here just because that tends to be kind of quickest to update. Uh, but you can also do, they've uh, got in-browser iOS emulators. Sometimes there's a little bit of a waiting list. I'm actually going to try to do this on my own app, and let's just see if this works. Make sure the API call works. So I'm just going to scan this QR code with my phone. You all might be able to scan this QR code too, see if it works. OK, so I've got here, worst lightning wallet. Seriously, do not use it. Invoice. Ta-da. OK. That is the worst lightning wallet. Let's see. You're right. Um, oh, 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 yeah. And that's because, um, so there's some differences between the web and the iOS and Android, how they handle some of the more native components. And that's where part of the, part of the, the, the thing is that like the whole idea for React Native is they want to use as much as possible of native components as possible. And because iOS, Android, and web may have different different default definitions of what button is, they'll look different. And that's where things like React Native Paper come in, where you can have a more consistent experience across um, devices. So it just it's a trade-off. And it, I mean, if we wanted there to be like specifically the same, we can very easily just add our own styling uh, that would make it force it to look the same on on all devices. Uh, not not super important right now. Uh, any questions before we dive into LN Pay? Uh, can someone confirm they were able to scan the QR code and get it working on their device? You you will definitely need Expo Go on your um, phone, and, and I was able to scan this just for my default camera. Cool. What's it say? Awesome. And if you hit the blue button, does it give you the info? Sweet. OK, it works. So you can scan. And I'd be curious if people watching this later scan this. Well, by the time you see this, it'll probably be more of a halfway almost sort of completed app. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, this tooling has come a long way. And just in the last year, it's made huge strides. Um, yeah, the, this, all of this tooling is available only at the expo level, not, not at the base. Congratulations. Um, I, and maybe at the end of this, I can do like a five minutes on kind of the pain in the ass that it was to get the Nostra libraries working on mobile. I, I eventually did, uh, but that's, you know, potentially illustrative of advanced usage. Okay, so let's, um, let's make our first L API call to Ellen Pay. All right, I'm going to set up a new Ellen Pay account with keys that I'm okay being super leaked. Okay, so Ellen Pay, let's just step through the, uh, so Ellen Pay is a service, as a guy named Tim, I think he's an Austinite, um, Lightning Network Solutions Software and Implementation Partner. If you're familiar with Ellen Bits, I would say just like a super simple, mostly custodial, closed source, like Lightning Wallets as a service. Like you just make it, very similar, yep. Uh, yeah, multi-accounts, there's, you know, the standard lightning stuff. And we're just going to do the basic stuff, invoice and, and balance. Okay, so um, I encourage you to create your own account. I'm going to do Chris plus uh, uh, hack at arcade.city. Okay. 
That was quite simple. Now, I'm going to go. All right, first, a little bit, little tour of, of LNPay. So services, wallets, you can create, manage, send, receive from fully functional wallets to segment your funds across services. Lightning node, you have the option of connecting your own Lightning node uh, to this. Uh, we're not going to do that. Developer dashboard, API keys and general integration, info, webhooks, API logs, API docs. Okay, so if I want to learn what's going on, uh, we're going to you know get into the docs, but let me first go to wallet. There's a bunch of stuff you can do via the dashboard. So this is a wallet that it created for us. Uh, let's see what happens if I go here. Details. Okay, so this is like a super basic interface where And you know what? I'm going to uh I'm going to fund this with 10 sats that I know are going to be lost, but I'm just curious to see how long it takes for that to happen. <laughs> but just to demonstrate that this can work. So let's do this. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Let's throw six sats in there. This will. What's going on with this button? It's interesting that it's not giving me an error message. Oh, there we go. An internal server error occurred. That's not good. Let's try 10. <laughs> Uh-oh, Ellen <Alan> Pay. <laughs> let me let me um let me try this. Now that I've refreshed 25 test. Yeah, it looks like this is having some problem. Well, let me try this again with a, um, well, I, this was working literally yesterday, although I wasn't, I wasn't using the interface. I was using the, the developer API. Well, let's go test it out. So let's go into the docs and let's go to where it says, let's see, we want to receive. So we want to generate an invoice. Okay. So here's the uh, URL. And so in our snack, where we put HTTPS JSON placeholder type of code, uh, that's where we're going to put this. And you'll note that it has colon wallet underscore key. So we're going to want to put the wallet that we want to receive into right there. Huh. Well, good to know that it's kind of working. And so wallet key. This says, see the access keys section on how to define wallet key, although it should be just in that. And then this, this is also extremely important. Um, the differences between secret access keys and public access keys. SAK is intended to be used server side only and is meant to be as secret as secret keys can get, AKA if that gets exposed, your funds will be stolen. This key has permission to perform all requests across the API. The PAK, public access key, is intended to be used client side only and is intended to be paired with a wallet access key. The PAK essentially serves as an account identifier while the wallet access keys provide a level of control over wallets. This dynamic is helpful for when do you want to have wallets perform certain functions client side, but do not want to expose your entire LNP account. Um, yeah, public access key cannot perform any list functions. So there may be some things um, because, for example, this says the public access key cannot perform any list functions. So as we're like coding in Snack, we are not going to be able to have the Snack pull a list of transactions unless we use the secret access key, which again, make sure this is a throwaway account if you're going to be putting your snack, your secret access key. That's where then potentially proper architecture would come into play. If you're actually putting this into an app, you might have your own backend API service where you have store the secret keys that your app talks to so that you're not exposing the keys. You know, don't, don't take 
this as lessons of, of best practices as we're throwing keys around LNP and, and, and web interfaces. It's just to kind of demonstrate proofs of concept that you can build on later. <laughs> Send all of your keys to me. <laughs> yeah, it is the worst. G g give, me, give me your keys. <laughs> okay. So let's test out the the dev the development documentation for generating an invoice. Uh, and th so they give you some options here: um, curl or the different libraries that they have. Node.js, Python, JavaScript. The JavaScript um, does not work for us. Um, I'm not going to get into the reasons of that. Just different import stuff that doesn't work with the snack environment. Uh, but curl does. So curl is just the basic level. Like you would do this from a command line. Uh, but we're actually going to be copy pasting this into a, a web tool that turns a curl request into a fetch request. And I had the URL saved on my other computer. I forgot what it was, but we're just going to Google it. That's what Google's for. Um, convert curl into fetch request. I think it's this. All right. So. That did it. Okay, now we're still going to have to pass in our, well, we're going to have to format this properly or put the proper info in. Pass through. Okay, so we put in the curl request, and that's literally just copy pasted from LNPay wallet send. And one thing that we are going to want to do here is put in the proper key uh, because this runs some kind of encoding on the key base something i don't fully understand it but when i was playing with this yesterday um the only way that i could get it to properly work was to run it through this thing with the key again that's not best practice but uh it's fine for demo purposes so i'm gonna go grab the um i'm gonna go grab the this one's a sack oh, okay okay so this wants both the secret access key and the wallet key for which to know, like, basically you're, you're, you're giving it control over, um, like, the ability to, to generate invoices for your LNPay account. Uh, actually, it'll be interesting to see if the PAK can work for this also because invoice generation probably shouldn't require the secret access key. Um, that's something that we could maybe study more in the docs, but we're, we're, we don't really care at this point. Um, we're just going to kind of experiment with it. Okay, so let me go grab these two credentials from the interface. Um, in wallets, uh, let me see where my keys are. Okay, here we go. So under developers, and this is, this, this is the secret one you don't want to share, so this account is compromised. I don't care, though. Okay, so secret access key. I'm going to go over to my curl tool, and I'm going to throw that right there. And then where it says wall underscore XXX, I'm gonna go to my wallet. I'm gonna go to details. I'm gonna go to access keys. The wall underscore at the top one, wallet ID. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the other way to do this, um, and we'll we'll play with it because because right now we're giving it the secret key for the account, which in the case of a purely client side app, they would not have access to this key. Um, I'm I'm fairly certain, or at least how it should work, is that you can right 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 now we're just passing in the wallet ID, but if we were to also pass in just the wallet invoice key, for example, that should be able to work without needing to put in the secret key. At least I think that's how it should be done. Um, but first, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go, um, copy this now that I put the correct information in there, I'm going to go copy this into my command line and let's see if it actually generates the response that we're looking for.
Got that same internal server error. It it might not like. Good, super. Did you um, when you did it earlier, did you use a new account? And did you, Austin? Did you use a new account? Okay, okay. Okay, I'll help you one second. So I'm thinking maybe it might not like that I signed up as Chris Plus because I've gotten the same error now in two different. Um... Okay, uh, Super, what's the error you're getting? You mean you're on this screen here? Um, can you start by again copy pasting directly from the generate invoice page here and changing start by changing nothing and seeing if it can generate properly because one thing that I know like this call this colon after the the key is needed let me try a couple of things here cuz what i might do is um pull open my uh, Yeah, I remember having trouble with that yesterday. Yeah, just make sure that the, um, yeah. Internal server error occurred. You gotta love those because they don't tell you what the actual error is. It's just something went wrong with LNP. Okay, but um, so Austin, you said you were able to get the, the LNBC back from it? Uh, let me think about how to get around this. Um, can you, let's do this. Yeah, super, maybe if you send me on Telegram, the curl, or just the curl, yeah. Yeah. And then I can air copy paste that to myself, I think. At Christopher David. Thank you. Yep. All right. Now let's see if I can copy this to here without. Okay. A cores error when what? Uh, 
Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I don't think bad request means cores, unless it says something specifically about cores. Um, yeah, so the, um, give me a second to email this to myself. Uh, while we're figuring this out, any questions anyone else has about React Native or Lightning or apps or the ecosystem or anything else? Well, this is clearly horrible and I don't want to do that right now. Okay, um, if I get my uh, phone on the Wi-Fi, what's the Wi-Fi here? I'll be able to just... Got it, thank you. So I can airdrop it to myself. <laughs> Welcome to mobile application development, everyone. <laughs> this is how you'll spend half of your time. You run smack into a wall and you're like, oh, what is this? But you, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's the simple stuff that can be complex and still drain a bunch of your time. Um, okay, so I've got those connected, so I should be able to airdrop what you sent and then test it. This will help tell me if the problem is like really with my account or if it is with... Uh... Oh no, you sent me the fetch. Um, send me the curl too. But let's go throw this into the snack and see what happens. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, let's just try this. Just gonna comment that out for now. That's not the right thing. Usually I can copy paste from one. Here's what Where can you eat for four sets? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, I'm pasting what you sent me into a note that I have on both computers because the copy paste is not working for some reason. Copy. All right, let's try not to horribly dox myself. Okay. All right, so I'm taking what Super sent me and I'm first trying this on the command line. Okay, that works on the command line. You are not getting the error that I was getting. Here is what it looks like when you make a successful API call to the LN pay. And right now this is not like formatted prettily, but we can see that it's got the ID of the invoice, that's probably an internal ID for them, the created at timestamp, the LN node ID, we've got the destination public key, the payment request, that's what we're gonna turn into the QR code. We've got the R hash decoded, memo is test invoice for the doc, description hash, payment address, number of Satoshis. So basically this is the object that we are gonna have our app kind of parse and put the relevant information uh, on our mobile app. Um, one of the cool things is that if you were to spend some time looking through 
the docs of, for example, LND, um, the uh, kinds of functionality that you have access to, there's like you know, 70 different commands that you can make to your node. Um, one of the guys, I think Alex, he, there's, he wrote the, uh, a Node.js or a JavaScript wrapper on top of that so that you can easily connect your app to um, an LND node. And there's just so much information that can come from an LND node. And generally, wallets tended to just display the absolute basic stuff, but there's so many cool things that you could build, uh, you know, doing your own, manage your own channel liquidity and, and being able to talk to APIs and represent that data in an app like this, whether it's web or mobile, um, you're 70% you're of the way to actually building like cool stuff in Lightning. Oh, nice. Awesome. Let's try that. So we're going to be sending sats to super if this goes well. <laughs> and get a nicer lunch. Croc command JSON? No. What do I want here? Fetch. Oh, and they got the B2A going. Okay, so well, that, that answers my question about what kind of encoding they use. And then... And you can also note that they're doing a JSON stringify here. That might be what the other one didn't have. Okay, so let's put that into our code and see if it works. All right, so that just fetches everything. I'm going <laughs> to... Get rid of the what? Awesome. Um, did this B2A work for you? Well, the that website you said in the authorization header, it says basic, and then it calls B2A, which is a like a base decoder of some form. Did that work? Okay. Yeah, I just I, I wasn't sure if uh, Expo Snack would have support for that or not. All right, and then let's. Uh, Sometimes there's some things that you think are built in, like big int support that React Native versions of things are a little wonky. Um, all right, so let's try taking that response. I don't know if it's going to come back to JSON. Let's try this. const JSON equals await res.json. And let's see what happens if we set invoice to that entire JSON blob. And let's go back to the web piece to test it here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So look at that. We built a thing in 20 minutes, a button that we say generate invoice, and it actually generates an invoice. This should let us pay super some money. Let's see if it works. Huh? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, normally I would copy paste this into my blue wallet. <clears throat> Let's see if it works. <laughs> no, it's only one and ten. All right, here, I'm going to do the reverse of what I just did. Actually, I've got that here now. All right, blue wallet pasted from the note. Sending five sats, ten to test invoice from the docs via lnpay.co. Potential fee, zero sats to one sats. Sent. Booyah. Okay, so we've created an invoice. It works. Um, horrible, you know, ugly, but now, so now, 
and generally in times like this where there's some ex functionality that's kind of experimental, you're not sure if it'll work or if, if Ellen Pay with the fetch will work in Snack, you kind of just want to like sprint with ugly code to like tell yourself, okay, like validate that, okay, this actually works. Now we can start building more finalized interfaces around that. So one thing we want to do, like Super said, is we don't want to display this entire ugly thing. We actually want to just pull out the payment underscore request and just show that. So let's do that first. And we'll be able to then remove the JSON stringify piece down here. But let's do this first. So we're going to set the invoice to be, for now, I'm just going to do JSON dot payment request. We, Ordinarily, you'd put more validation and like error handling in here um, to handle if there's no payment request object, your app doesn't blow up. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna, so I'm, I'm changing the set invoice to set invoice JSON dot payment request. I'm going down to invoice uh, where I have this JSON dot stringify. I'm removing this stringify piece. And then that will still throw an error because um, when, we in, when we initialize the state, um, we're putting in a, an empty object, and it doesn't know what to do with that. So we're just going to remove that. And now it just shows nothing. Uh, I'll actually change in the use state. It's just to be like a, a hyphen. So it'll show nothing. Let's make it two hyphens. OK, now I'm going to click Generate Invoice, and we have the invoice. Um, so we now have an app that just pays super five sats at a time. That's a pretty good product, right? <laughs> you could probably get one or two people to use it. Um, all right. So should we, by acclamation, um, figure out how to display this as a QR code, or should we uh, start pulling balance information or anything else that someone wants to do? We'll, we'll spend another 10 minutes on this and then wrap it up. Should we turn this into a social media app? <laughs> um, it's maybe worth mentioning. Um, so th that's fine. I'll, I'll kind of wrap that up. But uh, it's, it's worth mentioning that um, so this you know bull run that Super started, this demo that I built hooking into similar code. Uh, I mean, not not the full experience, but like the the kind sixty Noster event request. Um, this is just an example of an interface um, that works for both web and mobile. You know, built using Expo code, and the the demo code for that is in in one of these repos here. Um, yeah. So let me, let me just say some concluding thoughts. Um, I like one thing Austin said in his presentation, which was that there's going to be a whole wave of application developers entering the space, the Bitcoin space, and they're not all going to be, um, you know, low-level protocol nerds caring about what's going at the BIP level and arguing about, you know, all of the many wonderful things that get discussed uh, at at a, a Bit Devs and and you know, BIP level protocol stuff. I love you know, following all that stuff to the extent that I can. But I happily let most of that kind of go in one ear and out the other because um, I want to help flesh out what the application layer of Bitcoin is. I know that there's going to be, you know, more help and maybe tooling or some sort of platforms to make things like Bitcoin and Lightning and perhaps Noster tooling available so that developers don't have to spend, you know, the year that I spent over the last year diving into protocols and getting the level of familiarity that I now have uh, to be able to answer questions like, how do we add images and videos? Well, now I can tell you about what I think makes sense from the Sphinx model and not, and, and how to do that, do this with Nostra or whatever. But um, I'm really interested in helping solve for people coming into the space that have a background or they're just super passionate and they're web developers, they have related skills. Uh, and you can see how possible, how easy it is relatively once you have you know the, the the tools and frameworks that can help you get started quickly to come in and it's 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 not too complicated you can, you can read the docs uh you can learn you can hack something together um i i, I really want to encourage uh i think everyone here to hopefully participate in this bolt fun legends of lightning thing that's happening uh car talked a bit about that the kickoff for that uh is next weekend here that's kind of local kickoff for that but 
you know, global tournament, six months or six weeks of people banging on stuff together. Um, I'm going to be participating in that. I'm going to be basically relaunching Arcade, kind of the new version of it, um, using le kind of leaning into some of these 3D powered experiences. But um, hope to see you guys there next weekend. If you have any questions, um, I'm always available. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter. It's probably the best place. Um, DM me, uh, Arcade City Mayor. Uh, if you're watching online or from home or whatever, um, also feel free to hit me up on Twitter with any questions about React Native. Um, if there's interest, maybe we can make a chat channel on the Noster Enigma channel and, I don't know, nerd out about it. And there's also some decent um, like communities on the Twitter spaces around, like, uh, not spaces, but they've got like a community thing for Bitcoin software engineers where people are having some conversations like this. Uh, any final questions before we wrap up? Awesome. Well, I'll be around for a little bit longer if you want any other help, but uh, I'll end there. Thank you.